if you want to stay being a broke idiot, don't listen to this yeah. video. And then he'll, yeah. be like, he'll be like, here's the first lesson for you. Do this. And I know what you're going to say. Blah, blah, blah. Well, here's what I say about that. And then he'll like flash his like fancy shit. So Sam texted me this morning and he goes, we did over 100 million views this year for the podcast. And 100 million, I thought he was wrong. I was like, no way. You got to go double check that. Uh, he was right. We did. And that is way more than I thought we did. That is a bonkers number. I remember when we started this podcast, that sounded completely crazy. And what we wanted to do today, it's the end of the year. We wanted to look back and find what were the key takeaways and lessons that we learned from the 100 million views that we had this year on the podcast. So what were the biggest things that stood out when we look at the whole year? What were the biggest takeaways that we had? Uh, Sam, wh where do you want to start? Yeah, let me, let's just get the lead out the way. Let's start with the numbers. So I'm going to give you, I'll be transparent about a bunch of numbers, but not all, but a few. Um, all right. So in the last 12, 11, uh, so we have 11, we have 10 days left in the new year. So I, we're not actually at a hundred million. I think technically we're at 95 million, but I think it's the past few months, it's been like 5 million a week. So on YouTube, we got 80 million downloads or 80 million views so far. That includes YouTube shorts, which is those pop off sometimes and we'll get millions of views. And so I don't put too much emphasis on that. But so uh, YouTube was around 80 million. And then downloads for the podcast, the actual podcast. So we call we call everything the podcast, but there's basically we call it the RSS feed that's Spotify, iTunes, whatever you listen to your podcast. That was around 15 million. And so collectively, we're at, at about 95 million. We did 131 episodes, um, which is a ton, by the way, like this job, it's fun, but that's a lot of work. Do you agree? <laughs> like, or or do you do you still think that every episode is fun? Every episode is fun to me, and I feel like I'm able to. Um, I feel like I'm able to improvise well. So it is a lot of work, but there are some days. Some of our best episodes are ideas we have ninety minutes before we record, and someone sends a text saying, "Actually, what if we tried this?" And uh, those turn out really well sometimes. And I think it's because what we've tried to do is make this podcast the byproduct of the other work we do. So it's like the, the basic business model is do interesting business shit. So, so invest in businesses, create businesses, talk to interesting people. And then the pod is just distill the, you know, the, the most interesting 10% that you're allowed to talk about and go talk about it. And so if we do that right, the pod's pretty easy. When we don't do that right, then the pod gets pretty hard. But it's kind of like exercising. Like some days I don't want to do it. And then almost every single time, even if it's a bad episode or something I didn't like, I didn't love, I feel happy and I'm proud that I did it. So right. for me, it's, it's, it's like exercise. Um, all right. And I'll give you a few more stats. So do you want me to go through the most pop, the top three most popular episodes? Yeah. What are they? All right. So we actually have two categories. So which is weird because the most popular episodes on YouTube are not the most popular episodes on podcasts. So again, RSS feed. So the three most popular episodes on Megaphone, that's what we used to track this. The first one is the greatest businesses of all times, PsyOps as a service, work harder, not smarter hack. That was the, the title. The second one was brainstorming chat GPT business ideas with billionaire Dharmesh Shah. And the third one, shockingly, I didn't think this was going to be the top one or one of the top ones was Nick, Nick Huber, how to make millions from content without selling ads. That was the most popular, the top three most popular on podcasts, the top three most popular on YouTube. It was the same one, actually, it was brainstorming chat GPT business ideas with the billionaire. It was with Dharmesh Shah that has 450,000 views. I don't know this for sure. I think he did something Dharmesh did to manipulate this. I think he <laughs> for sure emailed this out to his audience. I wouldn't be surprised if he bought ads or did something because Darmesh loves to win and be number one. So he's number one on YouTube. <laughs> the second most popular one on YouTube, 10 years of money wisdom in under 20 minutes, 425,000. That is you by yourself. And I think you made that episode with YouTube in mind. Is that right? Yeah. Made that as a YouTube first. And it worked. 
And then the third one was very recent. It was November 2nd. How I bought a multi-million dollar egg carton business for $0, 391,000 views on YouTube, Sarah Moore and Sean. And then I'll just say the fourth one was Martin Scarelli when we interviewed him that had 257,000 views. Right. Um, so that was a, th- some of those were a bit surprising. What do you think about that? Those make sense to me. I mean, each of those is basically when I read the title, I'm like, yeah, I'd click. I click that. And that's basically what what works on YouTube is I click that and then you got to deliver on the promise. And so, uh, you know, maybe this is maybe this whole content thing is a lot simpler and you just got to get the get the titles right. And then you work backwards from there, make the content off the title. Well, and this this point is for any content creator out there. We you and I this show, we are kind of bastard children of content creators. So we started without YouTube. We only went for podcast downloads on podcast apps. I think we had a YouTube channel, but it was really like you and I went to Best Buy and we bought a camera and we just set it there and we just uploaded it. And and so we didn't really care about it. I think we only started caring about a year ago. And uh, what's crazy is if you really want to do it the right way, Or maybe not. But the really right way is you start with one in mind and you go all in on that. We didn't go all in on YouTube. I don't think we should have, but but I understand the argument that we should have because what works on YouTube doesn't always work on RSS feed and vice versa. Um, And so speaking of YouTube, by the way, do you want to hear... Here's a few more stats. So we added... Uh, so we did 131 episodes. We added about 250,000 subscribers. Oh, sorry, 210,000 subscribers. Subscribers. We started the year at 150,000, and we ended with 360,000. And you want to know the the biggest needle mover besides actually caring about YouTube? Uh, do you want to know what it was that got us subscribers? Uh, I'm going to guess it's the gentleman agreement. Is that not it? The, the gentleman's agreement. And so <laughs> for all the listeners out there, here's another takeaway. When you hear a YouTuber say, click the subscribe button and all that, and you hear everyone say that, and it gets, you, you think it doesn't matter. We saw a, there's a distinct point in the chart where we asked people to subscribe and it went up. And so like, it absolutely works. And so it's sort of like the thing, you know how people say, why are you buying ads on Facebook? Nobody uses Facebook. No one clicks ads. Nonsense. That is absolutely not true. I can't find this client info. Have you heard of HubSpot? HubSpot is a CRM platform, so it shares its data across every application. Every team can stay aligned. No out of sync spreadsheets or dueling databases. HubSpot, grow better. Yeah, and actually, that was one of my takeaways for the year was when we were like, all right, we should start growing on YouTube. What do we, you know, what do we not like about what, what's stopping us from wanting to do that. And one of the things is, dude, I don't want to be that guy who's like, all right, guys, if you like this video, click the like button and smash the subscribe button and turn on notifications as well. It's like, oh God, I got to turn into, you know, like inflatable arm YouTube guy. And, uh, you know, like in front of the car dealerships, it's like that, that wave, you know, inflatable <laughs> arm balloon thing. I was like, oh God, I don't want to do this. But you had a really great idea of this idea of the gentleman's agreement. So basically, how do you do the cringe thing in the non cringe way, right? How do you turn lemons into lemonade? You did it with the gentleman's agreement. I think we also did it recently with the thrill of the shill where it's like, yeah, all right, look, we want to have ads to promote our businesses. Cool. That's fine. And I think the audience gets that that's fine, but how do we not make this an experience that's annoying for us to do like sit down and record these like shitty ad reads. And then on the audience side, they just want to hit the skip button. It's like, what would be neither? What would be fun for us and actually fun for them to listen to? And then when we switch to the thrill of the show, I feel like that was a good idea. And I think that's something that people should do more of if you could pull it off, right? Um, you should basically set a standard of like, no, 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 I'm going to have my cake and eat it too. And uh, I feel like we did that in two areas this year. And I, I feel like that's a that's something worth worth remembering as we go into next year of like, all right, what would also be... Um, Instead of something that's kind of lame or a bit of a drag or just kind of extra work, how do we make it awesome for us and the audience? Because it didn't take that much more effort to do that. It just took a little bit of, uh, you know, charm. No, and it wasn't hard at all. (laughs) The problem was the gentleman's agreement that we would always tell people about. It like faded out. Like it got. We forgot to say it. It got not novel. And we were like, oh, shit, we have to come up with another one. And. I like watch all these YouTube videos and I just see one and I write it down and I'm like copying that, copying that. <laughs> and I just have forgotten to say it. So we've screwed up by not being consistent. Do you want to go like 
uh, tit for tat a little bit and like just go through like interesting things that you've learned throughout the year? Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, I'll go first with one. So this podcast is steady Eddie. This podcast is the tortoise, not the hare. So it grows very steadily. You could put up this chart from Social Blade that's like your, our YouTube growth. And it's great in that, you know, we started the year under 150,000. We're ending the year almost 400,000. But there's like no spikes. This thing is just a line that's just creeping up like a, you know, like this is like if my uncle goes for a hike, this is what it would look. This is like what it would look like. It's a, it's a map. It's like this is his Strava right here. And so I'm like, what is this? This is so different than everything else I do because I am much more of a go for the home run, try to do something incredible. And then if it doesn't work, or even if it's like, you know, you find something that's good, I uh, just don't really follow through. And this is like uh, a leak in my game in a way, but I kind of took some pride in this. Um, so let me give you some examples. So on Twitter, we all joined this group chat called the 100K Club. We all had, I don't know, 10 to 20,000 Twitter followers, and we all, five or six friends, we all wanted to hit 100K. We independently had that goal, and we all did it. We all surpassed it. Um, but we all did it very differently. Nick Huber, uh, Nick Huber did it, and he's kind of polarizing. So he'll say controversial shit that uh, he believes, but he'll kind of spice it up a little bit. He knows what he's doing. He uses controversy to grow. And Saul Hill's like, every day I wake up and I open a fortune cookie and then I type it out. Whatever it was, I'll put that <laughs> on Twitter. And I'll do that every single day and I'll do a thread every, every Tuesday yeah. and Thursday. And why would I not? It works. And we're like, why would it not? Because it's... So boring to do that, but he's, <laughs> he did it and he did it and he grew l the most out of all of us. I think he's like at a million and he did it with like what I'll call more cookie cutter stuff. Yeah. Feel good. You know, kept it, uh, you know, pretty safe. No controversy, no real, like, I would say like not much original, you know, storytelling or, or wisdom, but more like general best practices, like kind of, uh, you know. Stuff we've heard before, but packaged well. He's posted so many videos of children and just probably titled it "Humans Are Amazing." Yeah, but, like, oh, I love like... my son. <laughs> I'm like, I'm never gonna write that shit. Right? Like, you know, I looked at my son and I was like, Hey, listen, you're never getting that. All right, you're never getting that from me. I'm not. I'm not using you for that, and you're not using me for that. All right, we're not doing that. But jokes aside, you know, Sawhill was more of consistency, and um. And just put out, uh, you know, he was ready to hit base hits. And he just base hitted his way to a million. And I did the opposite. I didn't have a schedule. I didn't draft things. I didn't have a ghostwriter. I didn't do anything. I just had, a, I had probably six tweets that went viral. One was like this clubhouse thread. One was about the metaverse. One was about Elon Musk. One was about whatever. I just had a couple of these things go, go really, really viral. And I would go weeks and weeks without even tweeting. And then I would just do that. And, and I got to maybe 350,000. And so here's the lesson learned. The joke's on me in the end. So this is kind of the, the long one to take away is I was like, your boy's a home run hitter. I just go for the big swings. I don't have to do all that consistency BS. I just come in, just mic drop with a viral thread and I peace out. And I was so happy with myself. And I kind of looked up at the end of the year. I was like, huh? Like, the people who did the consistency thing got way further and had and did way less like uh, they didn't have to pull a rabbit out of a hat to do it. And I felt like I was having to pull a rabbit out of a hat in order to, to get growth to happen. And because that's so hard, I could only do it so often. The podcast, because I do this with you and you are a more structured, disciplined guy, you're like, let's set recording dates and let's never miss them. And I'm like, dude, what if we did like 10 episodes in the next two days? But then, like, you know, if I'm busy, let's not do an episode. Like, I would have had a totally different schedule. I would have such worse results. And when I look at this, it's like, damn, consistency wins again. And this brings me to the way, the it's, real... uh, it's five. I think we're, is this 550 or 520? So we're like 500, yeah, 500 plus episodes. Yeah. 533, Ari said. So we're 500 plus in. It's a lot. That's a lot. And we record like clockwork, same time, same days, every week, no excuses. And so, I would have never done some that excuses. On my own. We've had some excuses. Well, the ex but the, we have reasons. Not, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sickness, children, and uh, that's about it. So, all right. So, but I guess the, the the this takes me to one of the biggest lessons I learned was through the podcast we met Andrew Wilkinson. People know about him, 
but I also met his business partner who you know, Chris. And Chris said something at a dinner that I've, I've shared on the podcast, but it, w- it was the question of the year. He goes, you know, somebody was talking about some something they did, they failed, they're like, oh, but I, and then somebody else to like kind of pat them on the back was like, well, oh, but you know, you learned so much. And they're like, oh my God, I learned so much. Yeah, so many lessons learned, so many. And Chris goes, like what? And you would think for somebody who went through this traumatic <laughs> experience and had so many lessons learned that they would be like, Number one, this. That's the most important lesson. Number two, this. Number three, this. Those lessons weren't at the tip of their tongue. In fact, the lessons weren't even in their head. They learned actually nothing. And Chris correctly called it out. And I had never heard anybody question this assumption that when somebody says, I failed, but I learned, he was like, you know, I don't think people really learn. And he goes, and in fact, some people who, when I asked them what they learned, they say something that tells me, They learned the wrong lesson. And I think that's what happened to me this year on the consistency versus like big home run virality thing. I think I learned the wrong lesson. I was cursed by the fact that I did go viral a few times and I I did pass my kind of 100K goal. And actually the lesson was, dude, if I just had consistently tweeted every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, probably would have took me 30 minutes. I'd probably be at a million followers instead. And... um. And so I think I learned the wrong lesson. And I think that Chris's question of, did you even learn the right lesson from this experience? It showed up everywhere for me this year. Everybody I talked to, I realized, uh, you know, more people fell into that camp. The outlier was somebody who went through something and had the right takeaway from it. The outlier was that. Well, I would say to you, and this isn't a leading question, but it, it is for me when I ask myself this, which is, is that even worth it? Is having, is being popular on social media even worth it? And I talk to a lot of people who are significantly success, more successful than I am in ter- terms of traditional success. They've built bigger companies, whatever. And they'll ask about getting popular on social media. And my immediate response is like, but why? Like you're doing, you're doing awesome and you could be private. That sounds way better. And so I would wonder, is it even worth it to have a million for you? In your case, actually, the answer is probably yes. But that's something that I always ask people when they talk to me about social media. I think for a lot of people, the answer is no, because it's almost the cliche example of uh, play stupid games, win stupid prizes. It's like if you play the I want to be popular on social media game, you win the wonderful prize of having a bunch of followers who you know don't really know or care about you. and you basically turning your life into a performance for them, right? So you sort of win the stupid prize in the end. For me, my, like, you know, after a bunch of soul searching, it became very obvious that the thing I actually wanted to do, the thing that would bring me the most joy in my life is like, if I get to be kind of like one of these like thinker guys, it's like, I think, you know, I don't actually want to be Elon Musk. I want to be Tim Ferriss. And once I realized that, and that sounded very true for me, I was like, okay, then I got to do that. I got to go learn cool stuff. I got to synthesize you know, information from a bunch of places and then, yeah, which is super fun for me. And then I'm going to try to teach it and I like teaching it and I'll, you know, I'll try to share it. I'll try. I like sharing it. Why not? I'm so excited about the stuff that I'm figuring out. I'd like to create content and I'm good at creating content. So it's a good fit for me. And so, um, for me, it is probably the right game. I wouldn't say being popular on social media is the right way to phrase it. I think it is like, uh, getting to be a thinker, like it, making that your, your actual sure, job. Sure, sure. Um, but you're right. Me, me calling it popular on social media. It's like calling it a creator. Like it just, it, it's like, oh, that's cute. <laughs> that's not how I meant it. But that's how it sounds like. Um, all right. The biggest thing I learned this year, and I have a bunch of them, but number one, the biggest thing. So I'll, I'll set the stage here. So I think last spring, I, I, do you remember what month it is? We were like, all right. Uh, I had, I was at the two. So basically when I sold the company to HubSpot, I had like a two year deal where um, I stock had a vest, whatever. That ended in February. And then we had to renegotiate some stuff, some some contracts. And I think we started that. When did we start that? Do you remember which month? End of April. End of April. It didn't end until September. Is that right? Did it? Was it September where it ended? Something like that. It's August, September. So we go to negotiate this. And I'm a pretty soft guy. I have known all along that I'm bad at negotiating. I You're just, like a fair roche, hard on the outside, yeah. soft on the inside. <laughs> yeah, like I, I just, I'm not good with uncomfortable conversations. I, uh, I, I just, I don't love confrontation. I want people to think that I'm easy to deal with, but I leave a lot on the table. 
I leave a ton on the table. And we go to negotiate this contract. And Sean, you were like, let me take a lead on this. And you did so many things that I thought were the stupidest thing ever. <laughs> and I was like, you're being rude. This is stupid. You're being like, you're asking for too much. You're being difficult. You're being yeah. difficult. You're in the weeds too much. Why do you care about this one? You know, it'd be like a five page or eight page contract. And you're like, this one sentence, guys, we need to talk about it. Like, we need to change this word from like, uh, uh, you know, like mandatory to optional, or I don't even remember. <laughs> yeah, like it, like you were like, it, and I think we probably had ten revisions, and I and we had a, we, you and I had to hire a lawyer to go through all this stuff, and we sweat the details so much. In my heart, I was like, everything about this is wrong, and you want to know something? I was wrong. You were right. You negotiated this wonderfully, and um. I learned so many things and I could summarize this in uh, something that you'd said. I think you said someone told you, which is the person who could be most uncomfortable in a negotiation will oftentimes win. Yeah, I think that I think that's it. So the way you said it isn't ex- actually the way I would say it. So you said, uh, you know, whoever's the more uncomfortable will win. And it's actually like the first thing in a negotiation to realize it's not about winning. Like both sides want things, usually different things. You have to make sure both sides get what they want so that both sides feel like they win. But uh, it is true that you have to be willing to be uncomfortable for much like almost like the definition of the word uncomfortable for longer than you're comfortable being uncomfortable. Right. That was the, that's what I was trying to say. Cause you know um, it's very easy in the moment to say, if I push this button, the pain stops and the uncertainty goes away and the item goes off my to-do list. And I, I, it's very tempting to want to push that button. Well, like I'm not particularly that. So at the hustle, we did enterprise sales, basically. So we, you know, hundred thousand dollar plus advertising deals. I wasn't particularly good at that. But one thing that I learned early on was, it w- for any salesperson, it's best to not be like a hard hitting. Like I'm going to sell you this. I'm going to sell you this. Instead, you say, "All right, so what are you guys looking for? Like, what would what what are you trying to get out of this? Um, what do you need more customers? Or you know, you you basically ask them what they want, and then you tailor a solution or ta- or 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 position your solution to fit their needs. Right. You did a really good job of that. We're like, all right, HubSpot, um, tell me everything you guys want, and w- we'll try to accommodate or 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 I'll phrase my solution to fit your needs. Right. And 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 we, you did a really good job at that. All right. Um. So let me do a simple one. This year, my cash flow, so my monthly income, I think went up by like four and a half x. However, I didn't, I, I was very focused on making money and I didn't, and I normally don't care about like, you know, expenses or, you know, it's like, you know, that phrase, it's like, it's not how much you make, it's how much you keep. That's true. I just don't really follow it very well. And the biggest expense <laughs> sounds good. Always <laughs> sounds smart. <laughs> the biggest expense always is taxes. And I didn't do a lot of tax planning. So this is a very simple one. One of my big takeaways for the year is, um, a lesson learned again that taxes are your biggest expense once you start making real money. And I looked into a bunch of different opportunities, and at the only at the end of the year did I um, do something smart, which was I know somebody very well who is phenomenal at real estate. They have a very niche application of real estate. Um, they crush it. Uh, like I'm talking about went from zero to owning a billion dollars in real estate with no outside capital um, in like, you know, eight years type of thing. And I watched them do that brick by brick. I know this tra- this method, this like specific thing that they do where they have a bit of an unfair advantage where why it works. And I never really asked them to participate in a deal. I was like, uh, you know, they don't take any external money, so why not? But I know that we have a good, really good relationship. So I was like, maybe they would take it. So finally, towards the end of the year, I was like, hey, can I like deploy some capital here? Because... If I can invest with you, I think I'll get a great return, but also I'll get that sweet, sweet depreciation. And um, so I will get a you know sort of a double return on my side because I get the you know returns for the property, but I also get the tax savings today. And I just started doing it, and it is so good. It is <laughs> so smart, and I'm so, I am so regretful that I didn't take this more seriously earlier. And Jess Ma came on the podcast, and she said she, it was her that triggered me to go take action on this. She goes. I go, do you spend a bunch of, she goes, oh, I want to talk about what rich people do with their taxes. And we didn't even really get to that in the episode, but during the pre-call, I was like, what do you mean by, uh, we should talk about it? Like, and she's like, well, I think just the general thing is that most entrepreneurs 
really don't spend enough time on, on their taxes. And I get it. They want to build their business. But she's like, if you just look mathematically, like this is going to be, you know, between, I don't know, 30 to 50 percent of all your income every year gets taxed this yeah. way. And 20 plus percent of your gains um, of all your investment gains going to get taxed this way. She's like, it's financially irresponsible to not at least spend five to 10 percent of your time on this. And then I did the so math and I was like. 10% of my time would be five full weeks of a year. I was like, there's no way I'm going to do that. But I was like, I should at least spend like two, one, you know, like something where I'm actually focused. So who did you hire? Commitment. Like a, did you do like a tax strategist? I talked to a few, but I, you know, the reality was it's not that hard. Like the real, real estate really is the best way to do this. Cause what you do is you take, um, you know, you take, in, ta income and you have taxable income coming from one place. You take that cash, you deploy that cash into real estate. And my, you know, my wife is a real estate professional, so we have we can offset the active income. And so you you put the cash there. Now that cash is going to grow in the property, but you got all this tax loss to wipe out your your taxable income, if that makes sense. So so you get cash on both sides, but the taxable income gets gets uh, you know reduced by using real estate. So it doesn't really take like I don't need well, to do anything. It, it, by the way. It, it is hard. It, it's hard to find deals that are are good. I mean, like I've well, that's the key. Deals. Like, I knew this for a long time. I was like, great. What am I going to do? Go look for fourplexes in Missouri? Like, I I don't have the time or the energy or expertise to do this. Then you have a bunch of different like you know fund manager type people. You're like, all right, I got to vet them and figure out if they're any good and 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 do a couple deals with them. And I could do that. In this case, I was lucky that I had a very longitudinal relationship with somebody that I had seen do this with their own money. They're not a money manager. And so, um, and they get, you know, a far above average returns because of what they do. And so anyways, that, that became, you know, the thing I'm going to do. So anyways, we, we should talk more later. You, you should do this too. I, I'm like so convinced that this is a good idea for people in our position. And I think most of our friends in our circle, we're all like internet money people. And we like kind of suck at the, the real world money stuff. Yeah, I suck at it. Um, all right, I've got a, another one. I've titled this Loose Cannon, Loose Results. So for the majority of my career, I've been a loose cannon. I would say silly stuff and it would get a reaction and I would get results sometimes. Uh, <laughs> I got to put that asterisk sometimes. Uh, the result like being a, a laugh. <laughs> <laughs> or like I was in the media business. We are still in the media business, which is like clicks, I could... Yeah. I, I can go the obnoxious or blunt or ridiculous route and I can get clicks. And the problem with that is as you get more popular, you have to decide, are you going to go all in on that? Or are you going to not go all in on it? Or you want to be this medium ground? And the medium ground is bad. And so here's, ex here's an example of someone who goes all in on it. Dave Portnoy. The guy's a missionary. He, but here's what, here's what that means. So he says ridiculous stuff. He had a sex scandal this year, uh, regardless of what the facts are. I'm not even debating what the facts of that of his issues were. He was accused of being, um, uh, I, I, it might have been like crazy, like assault, like some really bad shit. And he went all in on it and he came out with like, and he like, he kind of, I don't think he joked about it, but he like confronted it head on. But then there's other things that he's done where he's like, look, I'm so rich. I can do all this stuff. And, but there's a downside to that. The upside is he got lots of traffic. He, uh, you know, whenever he goes through any type of scandal, he gets lots of views and somehow imagine he gets paid for those ads. The downside is obvious, which is you are now this guy where you've got to live this life where you're this loose cannon guy. You say whatever you want and you're a huge target. Then we've gotten really close with Andrew Wilkinson, who is not a loose cannon. He says some stuff uh, bluntly, but in, and he's a very honest guy, but he's reserved a bit. More measured. Yeah. He's more measured. We had, um, uh, Syed on the uh, what's what Syed's last name? Syed Balky. Uh, Balky. He's one of the best guests we've had. Very measured. The guy's only thirty-two or something, and he's in the ballpark of being a billionaire. He owns all these companies. And off air, uh, when I've hung out with him, he's a, a little bit less measured. But on air, he was def like he he was very like I look. My reputation matters. I need to have a good reputation, and he cared about that stuff. We also had Kevin Ryan. Kevin Ryan probably the second or third most successful guy we've had in the podcast. Very measured, uh, very honest, but very like straightforward, but also like calculating. Uh, Sarah Moore was another person. Sarah Moore 
Sarah Moore, she explicitly said, I don't want to be famous. I'm only going to be here. And she still said good stories, but I'm sure that she like her reputation was in mind, things like that. And I think that um, I'm not willing to go the Dave Portnoy route for sure. I don't want that flack. I've said very mild things and I'll get flack for it. And I'm like, yeah, I just don't want to live this life where I or I go hardcore. So anyway, a takeaway is I've actually wanted to pull back some public persona stuff not reveal certain numbers. I don't want to be a target. I don't want to have to fight these battles. I don't get joy from that. I used to get joy from that. And I would respond to haters constantly online just to prove like, see, you can't talk shit to me. I'm like, I'm a real guy. I, I read all the comments. That's stupid. I don't want to be that person. That, that, that's a pretty big <laughs> takeaway. You, you've done a good job of like, you've not, you've actually had a few fires this year where you said some stuff that you got called out on and you didn't back down from it, but you also like didn't what? What engage did in it. I don't even remember. Um, sure there was a what did I- there was a time where you criticized someone who worked for you, and it caused a little bit of a spat on the internet. Oh, of, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I I don't remember another time, but I think that that's what I'm referring to. And in my head, when I'm hearing you say that, or and when I'm seeing that, I'm like, I want to stay out of this. I don't want any of this drama. <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want. I don't want this stress. You know, we've seen it with Chamath uh, a bit where. He put himself out there and he's done some contradictory things and he's taken a lot of flack. And I respect that he's like owned up to it and he like faces it head on. I don't want to live that life. I thought I did. I don't. As we've gotten more popular, I I for sure do not want to live that life. And I prefer to be more private now than I was in the past. That's a good one. Um, I have kind of a related one. So one of the best meetings I had this year was with James Courier. James Courier, for those who don't, don't know, he is the founder of something called NFX, which stands for Network Effects. They basically, they have like, I don't know, a billion dollars of assets under management. They, they invest in tech startups. He's been, in, he's a Silicon Valley OG. So he's been building successful tech companies for like, you know, 20 years or something like that. Yeah, he's had, I think, multiple $100 million plus exits. Correct. And super fun guy. So I go to his office. So I drive down to Palo Alto. I don't usually leave the house, but for James, I'm there. And literally, it's just me and him in the office. I was like, where's everybody else? He's like, yeah, we don't really even have that many people. But also, yeah, nobody's coming to work anymore. Everyone works from home. So it's just me and him in his office for a couple hours. And uh, he shared with me a piece of advice that really stuck with me. And I started seeing everywhere, something I hadn't really thought about. So he goes, he goes, can I give you some unsolicited advice? I was like, please. And he goes, you know, today he drew this like line on the whiteboard. He's like. He goes, he goes, I really like what you guys are doing with your show, uh, but I don't know, like, where you go from here. He's like, you're kind of in the middle. He's like, meaning if I think about really up market, he's like, you know, when we make content, we're not making content that we don't want a million views. If we did a million views on a piece of content, we probably made the wrong piece of content. He goes, because what I'm doing, and in fact, he's like, I'm trying to invest in, you know, whatever. It's the next Airbnb, the next Twitter, the next whatever. So he's like, I need the most ambitious founders in the world who are building, you know, like venture back tech companies to read our stuff, really care about it and think when I'm going to raise money, I'm going to go to NFX. And he's like, so you have us and A16Z and others that are trying to be really upmarket because we're trying to attract a certain quality of founder of which there's only, you know, a smaller pool, but they also care about different things. They're only going to, you know, they don't want to hear about the the vending machine side hustle. Like we'll, we'll be like, Oh dude, sure. this guy's got 18 vending machines. He's making 22 K a month. Isn't that sick? And like, he doesn't care about that. They're trying to get, you know, only people who are going to like disrupt the healthcare system or some shit like that. I don't know. So such a big idea. Who even knows what it means? And- By the way, I would disagree with him. I, I think that the, I, I think they care enough to listen, but not enough to actually do anything about it. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. yeah. The vending machine thing. Actually, you're right. Cause I meet a lot of these people and they're like pretty fascinated by like, uh, the economics of stuff that's outside of their world because they're just yeah. kind of business nerds. Um, I think they actually care enough to be entertained by it, but right. that's but that's about it. But like then you have on the other end of the spectrum, you have, you know, let's say, and I, I love Gary V, but you know, Gary V is basically like motivation, grind, like, hey, you gotta like his content will be literally, he's like, I'm gonna pull up to this garage sale and I'm gonna <laughs> flip this VHS for, you know, <laughs> on, on eBay. And imagine if I did that every day. You uh-huh. could, you, you, that could be your hustle. And it's like, so I could make, you know, a hundred grand a year. It's like, I kind of, a job can do that, but this is, I guess the, the entry level of entrepreneurship. And it's like, and he, so he has a huge audience, 
which I respect, but, by the way. But if I you just said, don't want to hey, do it, <laughs> Gary, you know, like what's the deal for like the best investments Gary's made, I think, came from his peers, like his friends he hung out with, not like his listeners in that way. Right. Not, not his sure. fans. Right. Um, and he probably like I, I shouldn't speak for him, but I guess like it's very easy if you're in that position to be like, it's great because I get huge numbers, but. I'm not necessarily, it's not like a two-way thing. I'm not learning back from my audience as much. Maybe I'm, you know, I'm happy to sign autographs and take selfies, but I'm not trying, I'm not excited to go have dinner with five people in this group because I don't feel like it's going to, you know, iron's not sharpening iron there, right? Like I, I'm a black belt. I'm more hanging out with white belts. And so I kind of want to, when I'm trying to spar, I want to spar with black belts anyways. So he's like, you have a decision to make. You're in the middle right now with my first million. You kind of have a foot in both camps. And he's like, it's going to be very tempting for you to go down market. And he's like, don't do it. He's like, go, if anything, go up market. And he's I agree. like, in the long run, you are going to want, you're going to be more interested in the topics that those people are interested in. You're going to not want to keep saying the same, like beginner level. Here's how you, you know, literally here's how you make your first million. Here's how you get, here's how you should quit your job. And here's how you get a startup idea. And here's how you incorporate an LLC. Like you're not going to want to make that content as you grow. And he's like, you should steer up market is like my only advice to you is that um i think that was so smart and so i don't even know why he said that to me because who's even thinking about that i wasn't even thinking about it but now like i'm just going to give you an example alex hermozu i think is uh, in one hand absolutely killing the content game i think alex is awesome i think he's super super talented but i think he's making a mistake in that he goes very down market i'm just going to read you some titles of his last uh, videos he's posted in the last like two months okay how to make so much money it makes you sick. Um, <laughs> <laughs> then, um, How to get rich this Black Friday. Watch this if you're tired of being broke. Uh, the real reason your business isn't growing. Um, a bunch of these, right? So like, I, I don't want to you know, pick on these, but these are more down market video concepts and they'll get views for sure. And like, the comments will kind of show you people like, oh my God, you changed my life. You're my hero, blah, blah, blah. And that, it's not that he's not doing a service for those people. However, I, I look at that and I think for me, the game I want to play is definitely going to be not to go down market, to resist the temptation to try to create that content and to focus on creating up market content, which is going to have a lower view count number, but it's going to have a higher value per viewer and more of the audience. And the, it's like, I'm creating a magnet. I'm not creating an audience. I'm creating a magnet with my content and I want to attract the right people. And so uh, anyways, that was a big lesson or takeaway for me that I wouldn't have otherwise thought about. Yeah, I think so. Like sometimes some of the contractors who work on this podcast will suggest ideas because they're just looking at like YouTube analytics. And I'm like, no, I, I, I eight, eight out of the 10 things I, I don't right. think would, would if work. If Apple sold iPhones for $5, they'd sell more units too, right? Like, but if you're building an upmarket brand or if you're Louis Vuitton, like you, you don't want to go down market. There's another guy we met. Uh, and and we the, fall victim to it as well. I, I don't want to act like our shit don't stink, but like, even though you and I will fight it, like sometimes we will. Correct. The only reason it. this lesson resonates is because it's something I'm wrestling with, right? If I yeah. have a solved problem, I don't really care about it. It doesn't stand out as a big takeaway because I didn't, I didn't have the problem in the first place. This is a problem I have. So I'm trying to figure out where to go. And this advice was very helpful. Um, there's another guy who does this. Have you seen this guy on Instagram? The genius CEO. Yeah. 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 Do you he know came him to, personally? He, he's in Austin right now. I think he's so funny. I think he's, he's so, so funny. funny. So like, I find him hilarious. And like, when I met him, I can't tell if his Instagram is a joke. Like it's like, there's a lot of like nuggets in there, but he'll be, <laughs> he'll be like bad bunny is only making $30 million a year. What a bitch move. We're going to teach this guy how to make a billion. Like, he'll like insult yeah. these people. And it's yeah. pretty funny. Yeah, he'll be like, uh, he goes, this product, this product is going to bust faster than a bunch of you chumps out there. So let me tell you how <laughs> I would do it. And I was like, whoa, yeah. like, what a hook. Um, but so we met this guy in real life. In real life, total sweetheart and very smart guy, right? Super nice dude, humble, whatever. And then I'm like, and then I'm like, why do you have this like ridiculous mustache? Your fingernails are painted. You got this like, crazy chain and a gucci purse but like well he looks like a celebrity he's like a tall yeah, good looking guy he looks like but an he, ig like uh, like a, a yeah. male ig thought but you're in person you're a totally respectable humble nice guy dad and he was like oh yeah i created this character he's like i realized like what hits on ig is going to be like 
fancy cars, fancy shit, six pack abs, hot girls. And so he's like, you know, I just do that. It's my character. And I built a following. So he's got 200,000 followers on here. His content is hilarious. It's and so funny. He's, but he's selling, uh, you know, FBA, you know, uh, you know, basically like I made my millions selling drop shipping, basically, uh, you know, doing FBA brands. Uh, you know, you're, if you want to stay being a broke idiot, don't listen to this yeah. video. And then <laughs> yeah. he'll, be like, he'll be like, here's the first lesson for you. Do this. And I know what you're going to say, blah, blah, blah. Well, here's what I say about that. And then he'll like flashes like fancy shit. He's like, this is a video of me buying this Von Cleef, uh, you know, necklace. It's so a- funny. Any more I questions? love it. And I'm like, wow, well, what is <laughs> happening with this guy? But I think he's also going to be trapped in the down market thing, right? He's selling a mastermind you got to p- go pay to get into. He's going to make millions of dollars doing this. But I don't think he's got any like, you know, I don't think he's got any way out. You know, that that is a uh, he's cornered himself in that way. Sure, sure. Yeah, I, I, he's a good follow. He, he's very <laughs> funny. Um, all right. Let me give you another one. So the biggest takeaway that I, I want people to have from this podcast, we've done it now for three or four years is and and, I, and, and at first I uh, like I'll go get a haircut and they'll be like, so what do you do for work? And I was like, oh, I do this. I do that. I I work on this podcast and they're like, what's the podcast about? And I'm like, well, it's called My First Million, but it's not like the title is inaccurate. And, and I'll, I'll explain what it's about. And what, what I what I tell people is that, look, we've had multi multi billionaires on this show. We've had employees at companies on, on this show. I think what we care about is people who create a path and they do it. Not necessarily... Like I don't necessarily think just because you are a billionaire, you are particularly better than anyone else. Like What I care about is someone who says, I'm going to be great at this weird type of art. Intentionally be- choose a game. So they choose a game with intention and then they play the shit out of that their game. Right? That, right. Is that the description? Because that's what it is for me. That's exactly it. And so, for example, the guy I talk about all the time, Brett Adcock, he's not like me. He's like, well, I'm going to raise a billion, billions of dollars and try to create a $500 billion company. I'm, I'm inspired by that, but I will never, I don't want to do right. that. Or even this um, example we just gave, the genius CEO. He chose to play that game and he's playing the shit out of it. I respect that. I don't want to do that, but I, I, I kind of admire people who intentionally choose their game and then play the shit out of it. I admire the hell out of it. Or we've, we've had John Coogan. John Coogan um, started Soylent, which scaled to be a, a fairly large business. He's got another company. And now he's like a full-time content creator. He has a, a YouTube channel. And he, it's beautifully done. He's doing it wonderfully. And then we've had Rob Dyrdek on. We've had Laird Hamilton on. Guys who aren't the Silicon Valley type of lifestyle, but they kill it in whatever they do. And I admire all of them equally. And so the takeaway that I've had, which is there's a million ways to get to where you want to go, or there's a million ways to get to a certain way, uh, to a certain place. And for a lot of these people, it's money, but there's still a million ways to get there. And there's, you shouldn't just like, for example, when I moved to San Francisco, I was like, you have to raise VC, you have to do this, you have to do this. But then we meet, meet Syed, who breaks all I issues. imagine, yeah, I imagine he's worth 500 to a billion dollars. He started a WordPress blog, which sounds crazy stupid if you don't know what you're talking about, which I didn't. Turns out that killed it. Then he bought tons of gas stations. Now he owns 50 different WordPress plugins. Collectively, that does over 100 million in revenue. He's a young guy in Florida, not even a cool part of Florida. He's not Miami. I think he's in like Tallahassee or I forget where, like somewhere in Florida. <laughs> yeah, no disrespect, Tallahassee. I see yeah. uh, Ari. But Catching look, strays. I'm from... S- there's, just, there's just people yeah. listening to this pod just like, oh man, their hometown where they grew up. <laughs> Dude, <laughs> just gets, just Jort gets Lauderdale, I don't care. I'm from, <laughs> I'm from St. Louis, all right? I can say these things. I'm not from a cool place. So all the Baltimore's <laughs> out there, you know, like I, I feel love for you. Shout out to the tier <laughs> tier C cities out there. Yeah. It's, it, <laughs> it, it, it's it's objectively not like the place to be. And but what I'm saying is, I appreciate the hell out of people like that and learning about all of these different ways. And my biggest takeaway from this year and doing the podcast, which is, there's a lot of different ways to do it. You just have to choose where you want to go, and you got to choose what rules you're willing to play by. But there's not one way to do it. And I wouldn't even. I wouldn't even go as far as to say there's one that's likely. In fact, if I had to say that, I would say the one that's likely to get there is starting a small services business and just growing it over 50 years and paying yourself a good salary after year 10 and doing that for, for decades, which is not at all what I would have expected. You know, It's just a, a normal small business owner that does it for a long time is significantly more likely to have a higher income and die rich than any other way. But there's a lot of different ways to do it. And that's one of the things I appreciate uh, appreciate by doing this podcast. 
That's a great one. And I do think that that's the, if you zoom out, that is kind of the point of the pod. The point of the pod isn't saying do X or do Y. It's check this out. You can do X. Here's how that works. You could do Y. Here's how that works. You could do Z. Here's how that works. And by the end of it, you're either going to be in one of two positions. Some people hear all that and get overwhelmed. They don't know where to go. There's too many, po- too many paths, too many possibilities. Um, they, it, it sort of paralyzes them. But I hope that's not most people. I think for most people, the, the net reaction is kind of like, wow, winning and being successful is this thing that feels scarce if you're not around it, right? Like where I grew up, I didn't know any business people. Nobody in my family was a business purple person. Nobody, none of my cousins, not my aunts, not my uncle. None of them did businesses. Were you raised in Tallahassee? Born in Oklahoma. And, uh, <laughs> the, and so, you know, I wasn't Ari, around Ari it. Just, Ari just flicked me off or make it for the Tallahassee, by the way. <laughs> and so, so, you know, I, I wasn't around it. It seemed like this faraway thing that I didn't really even understand. There was no map. And I thought maybe there's one path, but I don't know it. And I'm not invited to that, to that party. And then my hope is that if you listen to this podcast, you're going to hear over the course of a year, a hundred different examples of ways to win and how they work. And at that point, it's just a matter of choosing. And all of a sudden, winning and success becomes this thing that instead of being scarce and difficult is abundant. It's everywhere. And it's right at your fingertips. If you just start, start doing whatever sounds most intriguing to you, and then you just keep playing the game, you, you know, it'll, it will work out for you. Um, that's, I think that's what the pod ultimately does for people. Good. I hope it does. Um, I have one more. Do you have one more? Uh, you go. All right. My last one. So we had Scott Galloway on Scott Galloway is a guy who he, he said on the pod, he goes, I'm worth over a hundred million dollars. And he also said in that same sentence, I'm deeply afraid of running out of money. We had Morgan Housel on most recently. And he said something like, um, he knows that you shouldn't necessarily set goals for money. And he knows like objectively he's got enough that he likely won't ever run out. And he knows that he shouldn't check his net worth. But then also we pressed him on it. And he was like, but of course, like if I'm laying in bed at night, like just because I know what I'm supposed to do, I still wonder what it would like be like to have more. And I don't think we've ever had anyone on the podcast. Maybe Jack Smith, maybe Jack Smith, but Jack Smith's like a freak. But I don't think we've ever had anyone on the podcast, regardless of what they have, they don't want more. And that sounds like a really negative thing of like, uh, uh, what, you have enough? Why do you need more? Why do you need to achieve this and that? I think it should be the opposite. And I think the takeaway is no matter what you have, you're always going to feel that there's another level and that you should one up. And I don't think that's a depressing takeaway. I think the takeaway should be you will always want more accomplishments, more achievements. And that is okay. That is totally okay. And that is normal. And just expect that wherever your goal is, once you achieve it, you're going to feel satisfied only for a short amount of time. And then you're going to want to achieve more. And that's basically 95 or no, I would say 99% of the time, that's true. And that's okay. It's okay to want more. Right. Uh, I think there's a healthy way to go about it. And there's an unhealthy way to go about it. I would say Scott probably has unhealthy ways. I would say I have unhealthy ways. And I think you can change those unhealthy ways to healthy ways. But no matter what you have, you will accomplish whatever your goal is and you will get there. It'll take six months and you'll say, what's next? How do I do it again? How do I do more? And just expect that that's going to happen. Yeah, I think when people hear that, it sounds like, uh, you know, it sounds wrong or sad or bad or something like that. But another way of looking at that same thing is um, the concept of infinite and finite games. And so the, uh, my, my understanding of it, I, I haven't spent a ton of time on this, but my understanding of it is a very simple understanding is a finite game is one where you play f- for the result. So you play in order to achieve an outcome and you're hoping to get to that outcome. And that's the purpose of it. And then an infinite game is one where you play for the sake of playing. And so you, you, know, you play because you want to play. Now, if you look at that in practice, so for example, for me, basketball is something I, c- I consider like an infinite game, right? Like I, I play because it's so fun to play and I want to play. And my goal is not to like win and stop. My goal is to win, but I, I wouldn't stop if I won because, but not because it's like greed. It's like, well, winning is a, is baked. It, the scoreboard makes the game more interesting. And 
in a, in, a, in a small burst, yes, of course, we're trying to win the fourth, you know, by the end of the fourth quarter, I want to have the higher score. But ultimately, like, uh, you know, hey, all right, let's run it back. Let's play again. Let's play again. Let's play till our legs fall off is, is basically how it's always felt for me. And that's the closest thing I felt to an infinite game until kind of business came in. And it's actually very, very similar. It's like, I like having a scoreboard. It makes it more fun to play when you do keep score. But I'm not trying to get to a result. To, I'm not doing work to get to a result and then I'm going to stop working. It's, I like playing. I plan to keep playing. I'm playing for the sake of playing. And the, but the scoreboard makes playing a lot more interesting and fun and intense. And, and that I, should be I, the I, takeaway. I that way. The takeaway is that because I had the, or I previously had the, if I get to this, I will not feel stressed and I won't work anymore. The reality is I still felt stress. I felt less stress though. There's no doubt, no doubt about that. I felt a lot less stress. And six months later, I was like, but I have to go and do something. I, I feel like a piece of shit just sitting here and I feel good contributing. And By the so, way, why do you think you, uh, if I just said, why do you still feel stressed? Why do you think you feel stressed after, even after the event? Because I think that I, I, the, the stress, I, I think that I, well, like to get like therapeutic, it's all baked into some type of childhood trauma and, and, and that just takes years to like unwind. But why does it, uh, why, uh, part of the stress is comparing yourself to others. Um, and so you want to achieve more and also wanting more stuff, which is, uh, what do they say? Desire is hell or desire suffering, is pain. Yeah. yeah. Or desire is suffering. So wanting more stuff, um, which I try to combat by just I'm like no I, that won't I try to like say this won't make me happy uh, comparing myself to others wanting more stuff and also just wanting to get rid of a chip on my shoulder right I'll offer you a different answer that might be true for you I don't know if it is or not but I, I think I, I believe this is more true because I hear a lot of people talk about it and it's like uh, childhood trauma it's like alright well nothing I could do about that that's literally yeah, the past it's, it's written and it sounds like it's a it's a long <laughs> unpacking process that I don't want to do that like I I still got suitcases over here I haven't unpacked from vacations I've been on like I just don't want to I'm not trying to unpack years of childhood trauma <laughs> similarly it's like oh I have to like stop the feeling of envy or w desire oh my god which will I'm never happen wired as an animal to do <laughs> yeah. that that sounds like a game I'm never going to win so I actually think there's a different answer which is um Emotion, the emotions you feel are much like muscles. It's basically, you've had a lot of practice at stressing. So what yeah. happens is people practice feeling a certain way and they don't think about it as practice, but what does it mean when you do something all the time or regularly? You are habituating yourself or practicing doing that. You're getting reps at doing it. And then some, one day, suddenly, they change the, the environment and they think that all that practice and that muscle that they've basically developed and practiced and repped daily will just go away and this new muscle called contentness and contentness and happiness will appear because the money the the bank balance in your you know Bank of America account has changed no way right and so i would actually say it's the opposite if you want to change that feeling it's not the money it's a, you have to find a way on a daily basis to practice having that feeling you want to you want to feel happy you got to practice happy you want to feel content and peaceful you got to practice content and pe peaceful you got to practice that more than you're practicing anxiety and fear and stress and all these other things and so for anybody out there who's listening sam is absolutely right your feeling is not going to change but i don't think it's because of these like deeply rooted psychological and historical reasons a simpler example a simpler explanation might be that I've really just gotten a lot of reps practicing one thing and therefore that's easy and familiar and habitual for me. And I got to start practicing the other. The same thing happened when we sold the Milk Road. I talked to Ben and I was like, Ben, how does it feel for your first kind of big exit for you? And he's like, honestly, it doesn't feel like I, I'm kind of disappointed. Like it doesn't feel like very much. Like it doesn't, I don't feel that much. And I go, he's like, maybe it's because maybe if the number was bigger, maybe this, right? He started going down that path. And I was like, no, dude, it's because you're trying to feel like this kind of victorious joy. How many days out of the year, the last 365 days, did you feel that? Like zero. Did you let yourself feel that? Zero. And so what did you think? All of a sudden today, you're going to turn on and be really good at feeling that? Like, no, dude, it's practice. Like, you, If you want to feel that, you, we got to do that regularly so that that muscle's there. And uh, do you, uh, Did you come up with this theory on your own? Or did you steal this uh, from Tony Robbins, when I was at that event, he has a similar thing. He calls it your emotional home. He goes, everybody's got an emotional home. He's like, because he's like, he's like, look, watch, watch this. Raise your hand if you're somebody who, uh, you know, 
sometimes gets a little pissed off. Everybody raise their hand. He's like, raise your hand if sometimes you are just super silly, having fun, being playful. Everybody raise their hand. He's like, okay, so we're capable of both. You are not like just an asshole or just a super nice, easygoing guy. We all fluctuate. And he's like, but it is true that we have an emotional home. It's the place, like your home, it's the place you spend the most time. And he's like, if your emotional home is that you are stressed out, it doesn't matter if you sell your company for a billion dollars. If you did, if you grinded for seven years, you were stressed all the time. You're not just going to become a different guy all of a sudden, right? Because that's your emotional home. But he's like, good news is you can move it. He's like, you can move it if you basically practice it, right? And he's like, so we want to basically, um, you know, you don't want to wait for the th- for things to happen to feel a certain way. He's like, you want to have it on call that you can change the way you feel like that fast. Can you do that? Can you change the way you feel that fast? And a lot of the event of Tony Robbins and the reason why people feel like almost like he's manipulative is because he literally is manipulating the way you feel. He's showing you that like you can change the way you can go from focused to jubilant to um, zen and calm and reflective to motivated and inspired in like a 30 minute span just by the way he's kind of prompting you. And uh, the trick obviously is to learn to do that yourself so that you now are in control of your own mood. You're the master of your own mood. And that's that was big, that became a big focus for me after that event. That was my big takeaway from the event was that. And then I started practicing that for like, like six, seven years. I wish you had come up with that on your own because you don't realize it. But one of the big three, like, uh, psych, uh, you know, so there's like Sigmund Freud and then there's two other guys who are considered like the godfathers of 19th century, like psychoanalytics anal- and all this stuff. And one of the guys is Alfred Adler. And he's got, there's a book called The Courage Should Be Disliked. That's quite good. And what you are saying is exactly in parallel with what he has said about like happiness. And like, it's like, well, you're anxious because you're choosing to be anxious and you don't, you're not choosing to do this other thing. And he's got this whole book on it, but right. you, d- you didn't realize it, but you've just <laughs> discovered relative, uh, you know, the theory of relativity, j- uh, uh, j- just like uh, Albert Einstein. <laughs> you didn't even know about it. So you're kind of like uh, one of the big three. This Adler uh, guy sounds like a smart guy. Yeah. I like, yeah. I like the sound of this. I'm going to go check this yeah. guy out. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so that's you. Um, all right. Where do we go from here? Is that it? That's it. I think we wrap it up. Uh, thank you for everybody for listening. You know, those, those views ain't going to view themselves. It's because of you guys. But you know, we, we, we just talked about wanting more. Sam, are you satisfied? Are we, are we done? Do we have enough subscribers? Would you say? We only have 360. You know, Mr. Beast has 100, 100 million. We're nothing. We're losers. I'm anxious about this. And so if you've enjoyed this episode, if you enjoyed any of our episodes, subscribe on YouTube, but also go to Spotify, go to podcast, the, the Apple version, yeah. and subscribe on all We could go those. to therapy and stop wanting this, or you could just click the button and make us feel happy. Which one? <laughs> <laughs> Save us years of therapy and just click subscribe. <laughs> and just say you're welcome in the comments and we know when you say you're welcome it's because you saved us years of therapy you just gave us what we wanted instead all right that's the pod <laughs> <laughs>